Hi, everyone. I'm Mina Mawani, President and CEO of Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. I want to welcome you all tonight to this webinar. This is the second one that we've had. We had one last week, and that is on our website. Please uh, try and access that and listen to that. This is the second one. We're here to answer your questions. We have uh, world-renowned experts and a panel of experts tonight to share the question, answer the questions that you have had, that you have been asking us for the past week. Our promise is to cure Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and to improve the lives of everyone impacted by these diseases. We are living in unprecedented times. So we want you to know that this organization, Crohn's and Colitis Canada, is here for you. We're here to support you. We're here to be for you. We're here, here for you to answer your questions, to make sure that we are supporting you in, the in these times where you want to know how does this pandemic impact you and your loved ones who are living with IBD. We really want to be able to share many, many uh, pieces of information for you, credible information and tools that helps you navigate through this crisis and enables you to make informed decisions. So what we have now, as Sarah also alluded to earlier, is that we have a COVID-19 section on our website and it's updated regularly in both English and French, which factors in the guidance from our scientific um, and our medical advisory council, as well as the COVID uh, task force. Our webinars are recorded and available for replay on our website. We're actively promoting new content on social media and by email and hosting live online wellness events like yoga and mindfulness sessions. Please uh, make sure that you take a look at those. The content we develop factors in the latest information available from the Public Health Agency of Canada, our Scientific Medical Advisory Council and the industry, and of course, our experts at the COVID-19 IBD Task Force. So this task force actually has been working around the clock and I wanna really thank each and every one of uh, them right now to the amount of work that they've put in uh, to make sure that we're answering your questions, being here for you and supporting you. The task force actually includes adult and pediatric GIs, infectious diseases experts, public health experts, communications experts, government relations, people from infusion clinics and, and also brings a patient perspective. So now I'd like to actually introduce you to the moderators of our uh, webinar, which you met last week, Dr. Gail Kaplan, who is a professor of medicine at the University of Calgary, an adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist. He is the chair of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council at Crohn's and Colitis Canada. I'd also like to introduce you to Dr. Eric Benchamal, and he is the associate professor of pediatrics, University of Ottawa, pediatric gastroenterologist, at the CHEO IBD Center Chair-Elect Scientific Medical Advisory Council. Thank you, Mina. Over you, Gil. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mina. Um, I just wanted to thank you and all of the CCC staff for putting everything together from this webinar um, to striking the COVID uh, task force. It's been a very busy week, um, and uh, this is our second webinar. Um, we did our we hosted our first one on. Uh, we could go on Thursday exact time and our plan is to continue to do these webinars every week. Um, you should be able to see how this pandemic evolves through what happens to my hair as I'm probably not going to have a haircut for some time. Um, but um, um, our goal is to be the voice for patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis to answer your questions. Um, we answered a lot of those questions in the last webinar and we want you to um, uh, to to look at that and view it, it's two hours, um, but it, I think it's a it's a good use of, of two hours of time. Um, uh, this week, um, we've received many questions, uh, not just from uh, this past week, but there were many questions that we couldn't answer um, the week before. Um, and so the focus that we're gonna have today is uh, overview of uh, social distancing and to highlight some of the new recommendations that we're gonna have. Um, when we struck the, struck the COVID task force, the number one thing that we were concerned about um, was the infusion clinics that are running through the country. And that was a, a number one concern from um, patient questions all across um, the country. And so um, we've actually prioritized that. Um, and I think we've added, um, as of literally this morning, a very exciting segment all around infusion clinics, including our panelists are going to be the executives and leaders from each of the different infusion clinic companies um, operating in Canada. Um, 
Uh, and then um, Eric's going to moderate a session um, with experts on pregnancy and IBD um, and pediatric infectious disease to really address the concerns of um, pregnant women, uh, newborns that might be born during the co course of this pandemic. Um, and as I reminded you um, last time, we have these QR codes um, and these take you right to um, websites um, that you can use to, to, to look at. Um, and um, the, uh, these QR codes um, will also, in our slides, have the actual web links, so you can actually type them out. But if you have an Apple phone, you, your camera can zoom on that and it takes you right to the website. For non-Apple phones, uh, you need to have, download a, a QR code app. Of course, these webinars are taped and posted, and so you'll be able to um, view any of the, um, uh, the video and anything that we have um, uh, after this webinar is done. Um, Eric, I don't know if you wanted to add anything uh, before we get started here. Uh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Gil. No, that's great. I, I appreciate the introduction and, and thank you to Mina for having us again and for hosting this amazing event. I think we had a lot of people the last time and uh, a lot of hits on YouTube in terms of watching the video afterwards. So please do go to the Crohn's and Colitis Canada YouTube channel. You'll see the video from last week posted, as well as the video from this week, which will be posted uh, within 24 hours, I would say. Um, I think, uh, you know, things are changing very, very quickly and we're trying to keep up. Uh, this week, you can see, last week I was in my office. This week, you can see I'm in my basement. Uh, I saw all my patients by telehealth through, uh, through my webcam. My parents were always worried that I would be a basement dweller, and now I am. Uh, as many of us are, but we're trying to, you know, trying to keep light, trying to, you know, uh, keep positive, and hopefully we'll be able to make this an educational and interesting event for you and not worry you too much, because I think the bottom line here is that we need to keep healthy both in mind and body, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to help you do that. Um, having said that we don't want to scare anybody, um, I've prepared um, an, an overview that uh, complements um, the presentation I gave last week. There is um, some repetition to it, um, but I, I like to think I'm going to go into a bit more deeper detail, um, particularly around the whole concept of flattening the curve and social distancing and, and the, just trying to explain in, in, a, in a lot of detail why that is so important. Um, and to understand its importance is to understand um, the gravity of the situation and, and how this is evolving. Um, and, and so I'm going to show you some slides that are alarming um, to me, I'm sure as to everyone else who is, um, and that's assuming that computer works. Um, oh, here we go. Um, so just, just a reminder, I just, just so that we're clear in terms of terminology, so coronaviruses are a family of viruses. They cause a whole group of different infections from the common cold to severe um, infections like, like SARS. Um, and then in, in December, there was a novel coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus. Um, it's previously unidentified, never been seen in humans. We have no meaning to it. We have no vaccines. We have no known antiviral agents for it. Um, and in people who get infected by the virus, um, there is a spectrum of illness. Um, and the illness that you get from the virus is called COVID-19 for Coronavirus Disease 2019. Now, I showed this slide to you last week, and this was on March 19th um, at 11.13 a.m. This is a slide from John Hopkins University. The uh, web link is right here, and you can get to the website through the QR code as well. And one week ago, I told you that there were 230,000 confirmed cases. And by confirmed, I mean that they were tested positive. There's actually a lot more people infected um, who are not tested. Um, and many um, agencies now are moving towards if you have symptoms that look like COVID to essentially home isolate and not to test. Um, so these confirmed cases do represent um, the sickest of, of patients, and that's reflected in the, the most uh, dire outcome, which is death, which over 9,000 people um, died a week ago. What's happened in one week? Um, so this is a screenshot from uh, this afternoon at 1.20, um, and uh, we've already now over doubled the number of cases around the world. 
um, from 230,000 people um, to uh, over 500,000 people who are confirmed positive. Um, and that includes over 23,000 people who have uh, died from the disease. Um, last week, I talked to you a little bit about the IBD Secure Registry. It's a registry that is um, capturing um, COVID confirmed cases amongst patients who have inflammatory bowel disease. Last week, there were 14 people reported in that registry. Uh, this week, there are now over 100. Um, and as we're crunching those numbers, um, we're going to bring out um, more information um, around the impacts to patients with IBD who are um, uh, getting this disease. Unfortunately, the, one of the, the biggest countries to be hit is the United States, and New York City has amongst the highest number of cases, including cases with IBD. In Canada, there's only three confirmed cases that have been reported in the registry. Um, speaking of Canada, uh, this is what I showed last week, again on March 19th. There were 700 um, cases um, with uh, 10 people who had died. And if we look at a screenshot from today from this website, which can be found at this link, um, we now have over 3,400 confirmed cases of COVID across the country, including 35 unfortunate Canadians who have passed away um, in total. Um, over 2,000 of those confirmed cases are occurring over the last four days. And I think the important thing to recognize is just that this is moving fast. Um, the doubling period in many regions in North America and Canada, US, so it looks like the doubling number of cases every five days or so. Um, so you can imagine how quickly um, this is spreading throughout, throughout the nation. So I wanna talk a little bit about risk um, and who is at greatest risk. So this is 100 people um, who, um, and let's say all 100 of them contracted um, COVID-19. Um, I wanna look at the distribution of who those people would be. 5% um, of them would be children under the age of 20. 30% of them, or nearly 30% would be aged 20 to 44. 35% would be 45 to 64 years old. And 31% would be over 65 um, in age. Uh, and this is in the context of confirmed cases. And we, we, the most confirmed cases, as I said before, are individuals who are um, tested positive. Um, so now what is the risk of each of these age groups? So let's start with children under the age of 19. Children under the age of 19, well, let's look at how many of them would end up in hospital, end up in a critical care and dying. And this is data based on uh, the CDC report in, in the US that came out last week. 2% um, of all kids who were infected were ended up being hospitalized, none in the ICU and none were reported uh, dead in the last week. So children do well with this infection. They just serve as vectors in which they can infect older individuals like their grandparents. Now, as we get into the older age group, individuals who are 20 to 44, so if there were 120 to 44 year olds who were infected, 18 of them would end up in hospital. Three of them would end up in the ICU and less than one of them would, would die from this disease. Uh, and now if we go into the age group of 45 to 64, and I'm, I'm 45, so I, I, I fit in this criteria, 25% um, of them would be hospitalized, of which of those 25 individuals, eight would end up in the ICU um, and one, one would pass away. Uh, and this brings us to our highest risk group um, with our individuals over the age of 65, where we can see that 40% of them, 41 out of 100 would actually be in hospital 16 in the ICU, and eight would, would die from COVID. So you can get a sense of how this risk increases as you get older. Um, so what I wanna focus on again is this whole concept of flattening the curve and, and why it is so important. Um, I'm a gastroenterologist from Alberta, University of Calgary. Um, I work within Alberta Health Services, and we have roughly 8,500 acute care beds in the province to take care of people. And I can tell you that before this pandemic, most of those beds were filled with people who were sick, heart attacks, strokes, gastrointestinal bleeds, many different problems that people brought, in, brought into hospital. Um, what we're worried about is in over the next three to four weeks that we are going to see a huge peak in the number of people who are gonna be infected with um, COVID um, and particularly going into hospital. And what you can see here, this is the line in which we can admit 8,500 people. Um, and if we go above that line, we are going to overwhelm our healthcare system. We are gonna lack the beds 
both hospital beds, but more importantly, ICU beds with ventilators. We're going to start having shortages of protection equipment. The healthcare professionals like myself, who are going to be on the front lines of this um, battle, are going to need to protect ourselves. Uh, and in those situations, healthcare workers can get ill, and there's going to be less nurses and doctors in those hospitals caring for people. And that's going to lead us to redeploy staff from areas where there are experts to areas there are less expertise. As a gastroenterologist, if I get redeployed to, to take care of people in an intensive care unit, you, you would rather have an intensive care doctor taking care of that person, but we might need to do these things to, to help people in a time of crisis. And the other important thing to recognize is that's going to reduce capacity to care for people who have illnesses in hospital not related to COVID, like heart attacks and strokes. Um, these people are going to have these events occur over the next um, over the next few weeks to months um, and we're going to be stretched to care for them the same way that we did before this pandemic. So one of the things that we can do is actually increase our capacity and I can tell you right now in this province and in every province and every health region across the country people are working day and night to increase capacity of acute care beds and ICU beds to uh, meet this need but I can tell you that most likely if the way things are going with um, there is the pro probability that we are still going to be stretched. The only way that we can do this increasing in capacity is if we flatten this curve. If we go from overall our healthcare system to creating an infection that is spread out over months so that there are fewer and fewer people who need to be hospitalized, fewer healthcare workers that need to take care for them, fewer hospital beds, fewer ICU beds. It doesn't mean that there won't be people who are sick and in hospital um, from this disease, it means that instead of those people coming into hospital two weeks from now, they come two months from now, they come six months from now, all those things allow us to preserve our healthcare system, allow us to increase capacity, allow us to gain expertise in caring for this disease, and will mean that everything that we do, from caring for patients with COVID to caring for somebody with a heart attack, is going to be better. So again, these, these curves are you know, challenging to look at it, they're kind of just ubiquitous numbers. I want to give you some ideas using kind of mathematical modeling. And um, one thing I haven't done yet is I do want to thank um, Stephanie Coward, she's a PhD epidemiologist in our in my research lab who prepared the slides and helped do the numbers because it's been really crazy busy. Um, I'm just going to see if this goes to the next slide. Okay, so what this represents is one person who got infected, let's say today, with COVID. The R naught, which is this value right here is 2 to 2.5. Um, that means that COVID, for every one person that gets infected, two to two and a half people will be infected by that individual if you do no social distancing. And I just wanted to show you what will happen in the next three to four weeks for this one person if this individual and everyone else was allowed to just roam around um, the city um, without any social distancing. This individual would turn out in the next three to four weeks to infect 115 people. 23 of those individuals would end up in hospital and three of them would die. What happens if we introduce social distancing measures? So if 25% of our population stayed indoors, protected themselves, protected society, well, this individual would actually only end up infecting about 86 people. Only 17 of them would end up needing the hospital and would actually save somebody's life. Again, if we go and now half the population does this, we bring in the infected number down to 57, the hospitalized down to 11, and we've saved two people. And if we can do the vast majority of our population to be isolated in their homes, protecting society, protecting themselves, the number of infected people goes down, the number of hospitalized people goes down dramatically. Uh, and while there still will be deaths, um, there'll be a lot fewer. This one individual might not lead to a death, maybe another one will, but this is what we're trying to do when we talk about social distancing, about keeping home, about isolating. And we'll go into more of those details a bit later. Now I'm just going to end my segment of the presentation uh, on this um, slide. I showed it to you last week. Um, I would recommend everyone um, coming, um, and I apologize, the web link um, is, is cut off here, but if you look at this QR code, it takes you to the Washington Post um, article. Um, and this really talks to you about why, visually, why it is so important to not be moving around. So this is a model in which we don't do any social distancing at all. Everyone kind of is free to go wherever they want. You can see the blue dots are healthy people and you can see everyone gets infected and eventually they start to recover. But we have this massive peak in terms of, of how many people and how quickly they get infected and the overwhelm the healthcare system. 
we compare that to a model where we do social distancing, where the majority of the population stays indoors, doesn't get infected, doesn't infect others, you can start to see visually how these stationary dots are protecting society while at the same time protecting themselves. It is a much slower path to being infected. And I can tell you, with healthcare systems are gonna be overwhelmed over the next month to two. Um, if you, the one thing that you can do in your part is to be that stationary dot. So I'll pause here and I'll pass it on to Eric to talk about um, new recommendations that we have from Crohn's Colitis Canada. All right, thank you very much, Gil. Just getting set up here. Okay, there we go. We should be able to see my screen. Um, so what we're trying to do is update these recommendations that uh, we've put out on a regular basis. Uh, these that I'm presenting today are really just the changes from last week. They don't represent, uh, I'm not gonna re repeat what we said last week. We actually met earlier today. And so these are sort of right, hot off the press and um, they're not yet on the website, but they will be very shortly by tonight or tomorrow morning, hopefully. And you can get them by going to the chromosocolitis.ca website, and this is a QR link to directly uh, uh, get there. The travel advisory has not changed from our perspective. Uh, again, we recommend that patients with IBD who are immunosuppressed not travel, but obviously what's changed is that the government of Canada is recommending everybody not travel at this point in time outside of Canadian borders. Again, but I'm putting this up again because the QR link here um, is directly to the Public Health Agency of Canada's website, where you can get all the travel advisories to know what countries uh, particularly are recommended not to travel to. So I'd like to start a little bit with some definitions first, because uh, we used terms last week that perhaps people didn't fully understand, and I think it's worth defining what we're talking about from here on in. So as uh, Gil mentioned physical distancing, which was previously called social distancing. We're not. We're now calling it physical distancing because that's what it is. Is defined by, by the Public Health Agency of Canada as avoiding crowded places, non-essential gatherings, avoiding common greetings like handshakes or hugs, limiting contact with people who are at higher risk, and many of you will be the people at higher risk who are immunosuppressed. Uh, so people should be limiting contact with you, unfortunately, except for close family members, as we'll mention in a second, and keeping at least two arms length apart. So that's two meters or more apart. Hygiene is defined in this case uh, as washing your hands often with soap and water for a minimum of 20 seconds or with a hand sanitizer, alcohol-based hand sanitizer with 60% concentration of alcohol or higher. In addition, you should be coughing or sneezing into a tissue and disposing of it immediately, or coughing and sneezing into the bend of your arm and not your hands. As well, avoiding touching your eyes, nose, and mouth uh, with unwashed hands. Self-monitoring means paying attention to yourself for 14 days and avoiding crowded places and increasing personal space from others. This is essentially something that we should all be doing already, uh, and hopefully you are. Self-isolating means that if you uh, have no symptoms, but if you have traveled or had contact with somebody with COVID, uh, stay at home and monitor yourself for symptoms for 14 days, avoid contact with others, but you can still go outside for walks, runs, walking the dog, uh, as long as you stay two meters or more from everybody else. So remember this word self-isolate because we're gonna use it in reference to people with IBD in a few minutes. And then isolating, means that you either have symptoms of COVID uh, or you were diagnosed with COVID or you're waiting for a test to confirm whether or not you have COVID. In that case, the Public Health Agency of Canada recommends that you stay home and avoid all contacts with others, even with family members if possible. So we previously uh, made recommendations on our website for IBD patients in general who, who were on immunosuppressive therapies, and they were general recommendations for pretty well everyone. We've since uh, borrowed from a model that really the British Society of Gastroenterology uh, 
produced in the past day or two where we're risk stratifying patients with IBD. So not all patients are treated equal, and we're going to look at patients differently depending on what their risk is of having complicated COVID disease, meaning having risk of complications from COVID, such as hospitalization, ICU admission, the need for ventilator, or death. So the lowest risk group are people who are under 60 years old, who have the lowest risk of hospitalization and death, as well as those on medications that do not immunosuppress uh, patients. So 5-ASA medications listed there, uh, locally acting steroids like budesonide, budesonide MMX, or steroid enemas, and the brand names are shown there. Uh, enteral nutrition, which is formula feeds or dietary therapies for Crohn's, such as those that we use in pediatric IBD. Uh, probiotics or antibiotics and other non-IBD related medicines like cholesteramine or uh, loperamide or modium. As well, uh, a low risk group would be people in remission who don't have significantly active inflammation. We know that having active severe inflammation puts you at risk for having poor health and therefore puts you at risk for infection. Uh, being malnourished also puts you at risk for infection. So if you're not malnourished, you're in that lowest risk group and not having any other comorbidities like respiratory, cardiac, hypertension, or diabetes. And so that's the low risk group where you really should be following the Public Health Agency of Canada guidelines consisting of physical distancing, hand hygiene, and self-monitoring as per everybody else in society, and that link is shown there. So the middle group, or yellow, are patients who are under 70 years old because we know that people 60 to 70 um, are at increased risk. Now we have that this uh, slightly lower group, uh, 60 years and older, who are on the, the non-immunosuppressive medicines. Those are kind of in between the lowest and the middle group. Uh, but if you're under 70 and you're on immunosuppressive medications, and then you're in the middle risk group, and that middle risk includes any immunosuppressive medication, so the immunomodulators like azathioprine or 6-MP, methotrexate, all of the biologic medications as well are considered immunosuppressive. And in those cases, if you're in that group, you're at medium risk. And what we recommend is that you avoid in-person meetings, you work from home if possible and hold meetings like we're doing today by virtual technology. If that's not possible and you have to go to work, uh, then you ask your employer for modified duties to allow for the physical distancing. So trying to stay away from customers or from the public. Uh, and obviously there's some leeway here for healthcare providers. I think healthcare providers in particular, because they're so needed at this time uh, of crisis, we, we understand that there's some personal decision that has to take part there and some discussion with hospital staff and, and other people like that. Um, as well, you should be using services for vulnerable populations. So for example, grocery stores are now opening an hour early to allow for vulnerable people like elderly or people who are immunosuppressed to shop then. So if you have to go shopping, you should be doing it then. Uh, as well, the laboratory services and healthcare services are sometimes uh, doing things differently for vulnerable populations. So you have to, if you have to get blood work, call ahead and find out if there's something available for you. I think it's worth noting that there's some, uh, again, I, I mentioned some leeway in this medium risk group. Uh, so clearly we know that pediatrics, so children who are obviously under 70, who are immunosuppressed may be at lower risk. There was an article published just yesterday in The Lancet describing about 300 children, 300 people with IBD in Wuhan province. Uh, and in fact, none of them got uh, COVID. And that was really thanks to social distancing and strict instructions from their doctors to avoid going out and avoid other people. In addition, we know that children are at lower risk of developing IBD, uh, of, sorry, of developing severe COVID disease. And therefore, um, even if they're immunosuppressed, they're at lower risk for having poor outcome. Uh, the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology uh, recently started a registry to find all the children in the world with uh, COVID who have IBD, and there have been five cases reported on their website right now. They're all teenagers. Most of them are on immunosuppressive medications, and all five uh, teenagers had mild COVID disease, so did not require hospitalization. In addition, there was one in, in the secure IBD registry that Gil mentioned earlier. There's one child in that who also had mild disease who did not require hospitalization. So we're hopeful that even if children are immunosuppressed, 
they should do well and probably do better than adults uh, who are immunosuppressed. And then finally, there's the high risk group. So if you're 70 and above, no matter what, you're in that high risk group. I'm sorry, but we, we know that the risk of hospitalization and the risk of death is much higher in people 70 years and above. If you're under 70 and you have a comorbidity, if you're under 70 and you're on steroids at a good dose, and we give the good dose in the guidelines that'll be on the website, uh, or if you have moderate or active severe uh, disease, like a new diagnosis or a recent flare-up, moderate or severe malnutrition, or the requirement for parental nutrition, that means uh, nutrition through a central line, those put you at increased risk even if you're under 70. So we call those patients high risk. And in those cases, we recommend that you self-isolate. So you stay home as much as possible. You do not work. You can go out for walks as long as you stay away from people, but please stay home as much as possible. In addition, we recommend that family members of people who are in this high-risk group also try their best to self-isolate at least avoid in-person meetings, work from home if possible, ask their, their employer for modified duties because they could be bringing COVID home. And we really don't want to put the people at high risk, at, at further risk because the, the virus is coming in from outside. I also want to just go back quickly on the med IBD medications uh, issue because that's been brought up quite a few times and I think there's obviously a lot of fear and a lot of concern on the part of patients with Crohn's and colitis, but our recommendation really there has not changed. Do not discontinue your IBD medications. We feel that you're at much greater risk of uh, major complications from both COVID and from IBD if you discontinue your IBD medications. In addition, if the healthcare system is very strained, you do not want to have severely active IBD and have to go into hospital. The bed shortages, physician shortages, and the, the high stress on the healthcare system, you know, puts you at risk just in that way. So we strongly recommend that if you're stable, please don't discontinue your IBD medication. If you get COVID-19, call your IBD physician and discuss. Never stop steroids suddenly unless instructed by your doctor. There's risks to your life if you do that. And if your biologic medication must be delayed because you have COVID-19 or because you're a close contact and you have to isolate, please contact your physician to discuss rescheduling that. Uh, at the last webinar, we were actually, uh, I think it was the same day or maybe a day afterwards, the, the, a day after the WHO, the World Health Organization recommended avoiding non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Advil, Motrin, Aleve, to reduce fever in the case of COVID-19. There was a report of, um, uh, of an association between these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications and more severe COVID-19 bad outcomes. Uh, this had, they, they, you know, basically a day after we had the webinar, they walked that back and said they're really, they, 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 are, not, they are not recommending avoiding NSAIDs anymore and they're waiting for more data to know whether or not there's an association. Uh, Health Canada has said there is no known association with NSAIDs. So right now we're saying that it is not associated with complications in people with COVID-19. However, we know that NSAIDs in large epidemiologic studies have been associated with flare-ups of IBD. So in general, we avoid starting these medications if at all possible. And then finally, taking steroids. Uh, we know, as I mentioned, that steroids is a risk factor for severe complications from COVID-19. It's less uncertain this week than it was last week. There have been reports from China that have looked at using steroids to treat COVID-19, and those people who received steroids got, had very bad outcomes. So that's not the same thing as um, treating your IBD chronically with steroids. Still, if possible, we recommend avoiding steroids. Don't stop them suddenly. Uh, speak to your physician first. However, don't start steroids on your own if you think you're having a flare. Speak to your doctor first again. And if you're prescribed steroids for your IBD by someone who's not your regular IBD physician, uh, please confirm the need for these steroids with your gastroenterologist or your IBD specialist. Remember, everything is changing rapidly. You can see there are some changes week to week. Uh, again, we're meeting multiple times a week to try to make sure that we're bringing you the latest information and the latest evidence and trying to make our recommendations based on the latest science, but things are changing super quickly. So please be patient with us. We're trying our best. 
And again, these recommendations should supplement, but are not meant to replace your doctor's recommendations or those of the local public health authority. So please uh, speak to your doctor or look at the website of your local public health authority. Thank you. So Eric, thank you so much for doing the recommendations. And um, you know, we talked a lot about social distancing and that's you know, relatively new from, from last week. Um, and there are a lot of people right now who are isolated in their homes. Um, and we recognize that that has a huge impact on, on mental health. Um, and so we've invited um, an expert, um, Dr. Leslie Graff, who's a PhD psychologist. She's a professor and head of the Department of Clinical Health Psychology at the University of Manitoba. Um, and Leslie, we just wanted to spend a few minutes talking to you a little bit about um, the recommendations that Eric's made around around social distancing, around isolation, and with these increasing requirements um, and the realization we may need to live this way for some time, what will the psychological impact be? And what can we do to adjust to this change? Yeah, those are really good um, points to bring up and things. It's really timely now to be looking at what we can do because social distancing, which most of us wouldn't have thought about or even know what it really meant, um, wasn't on our radar and now it's actually our new reality and as you said it looks like it's going to be some time that we're going to be in this. Um, you uh, Both of you have given information that's kind of concerning of course the rapid spread but in there is also a really important point which is we can we have steps we can do um, individually and collectively which are going to help and the social distancing is a key part of it. So um, it, it's um, just, just broadly, I think that um, one, one, one little reassurance that um, people can take, uh, or IBD patients can take as reassuring is that it's not just you who have to try and make changes or do something different, but it's actually all of us collectively are now being asked to work together to protect each other. Uh, so I think that's one reassuring piece. However, the reality of what we're all of a sudden in um, is something that I think most of us wouldn't have experience with before. Our ch children are not going to school. We shouldn't be out um, and about doing our regular things. There's not hockey games to go to. Um, there's a few, need, many needing to go to work, but still many who, um, uh, many who have to be home. Um, and it will be difficult. This, this is something new and different. Um, even if you really love your family, you're going to be in close quarters with them for, uh, for quite some time. And so we are all going to have to learn how we can do our day-to-day -day differently. Um, we're, as people, we're really built to connect with each other. Um, and in times that are scary or hard or something difficult has happened, we naturally want to gravitate to each other, gather, hug, share. And we won't be able to do it in the same way that we have um, that we you know normally have been able to. So all of that is just trying to frame what the struggles will be. Um, but I think going forward, if we start to think about specifically what this can look like, first of all, as you move into, if you haven't already moved into that social isolation or social distancing, um, you know, moving into that now. Um, means you are part of the solution and you are saving lives by doing that. When it gets into the day-to-day -the -day, though, what does that mean? Because in the day-to-day -day, it's, it's, it's hard, it's long days, you may not be talking with people as much or so on. So as much as physical distancing and social distancing is now happening, we want to think about how to counterbalance that with psychological closeness. So really intentionally thinking about how can I make sure I'm connecting with other people. It might be in your, there's already people in your home and so you can uh, certainly do more of um, things we might have, might have fallen away. Where are the puzzles? Where are the books? Where are the, where are the games where we can kind of connect together in the household? But many people, we have lots of loved ones and, and uh, others we'd like to connect with that are not in the house. Uh, they're not in the same community, they're not in the same province, and we know it's going to be some time before we can see them again. So thinking about how do I intentionally connect? We actually are in a period where we have so many options of ways we can connect. It used to be, you know, you mail a letter, 
but now of course we can text and Skype and FaceTime and uh, many other things. What I would encourage though is those are still distant. If you email someone, texting sure is closer but not as personal. I would really encourage that you do more phone connecting and more of this type of connecting where you can see the other person and in fact get creative about it. Um, if you have family in down the street or in another province but you can't see them, if you can link in um, through something that uh, like Skype or FaceTime that connects you like this, um, connect at dinner time and sit down together for dinner in, in a bit of a virtual way. We haven't really thought about that before, I think, but these will be the times to really find ways, as I said, to intentionally build that, uh, that psychological closeness. Um, the, other, the other aspects to think about are just day to day when you are at home, how are you going to get through that day? The first week you might be um, tempted to just, you know, sitting around your pajamas and catch up on all the uh, Netflix or whatever you had another chance to. But this looks like it's not going to be counted in days or weeks, but probably months. And so starting to build in a structure and routine. Many people may be working from home, get up, get dressed, go into your home office and focus as if you're at work. Um, or otherwise build that routine, with whether it's with kids at home or with yourself. Equally important is build in exercise. Uh, what are all the things that are going to help us to keep well over this time? Um, the basics are still going to be super important here because part of it is we're aiming to stay as healthy as we can to um, protect if we do uh, run into that virus. So what can you do in your place if it's harder or if, or if our social distancing requirements progress further? Start looking at the space you have and what types of exercises you can do. Look at what you can link into because it's kind of more fun to have, um, you know, link in with, I don't know, the yoga instructor or the, the exercise uh, uh, video or something to, uh, uh, to be able to, you know, be active there as well. So think about psychological closeness and how you can build that in. Really connect with the people that you are with in your household um, and look at ways that you can enjoy the time with each other um, and keep up those important aspects of routine and structure, exercise, and so on. So those would be some key points I would want to hit on. And what about social activity for children? Um, you know, I have three kids at home. The American Academy of Pediatrics this week came out with a statement saying that they understand that at this time, kids are going to have a lot more screen time. Yes. Um, how do you feel about them socializing through screens, through games like Fortnite? I have uh, my daughter's playing Roblox with her friends using Facebook Messenger video and Snapchat and other things. How, how is that good? Is that bad? Is that a concern? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I think there's a balance there. Uh, part of being on screens is just, you know, um, your eyes are only focused in this amount of distance. You get quite engaged and involved um, and uh, don't realize um, you're not physically moving around. So um, the aspect that's helpful there is if the screen time is really about connecting the friends, uh, the kids will be happy to see their buddies um, and be able to compare notes and some of that online game playing, you know you're not by yourself. So that part can be helpful, but the fact that it's through the medium of screen um, means that your child could be locked in their chair or on their bed for hours, um, which over time is going to be pretty hard physically. So being able to pace that a little bit with other types of things you can do around the house. Um, may not be popular with the kids, but this is a good time to have shared responsibility with everybody around, I don't know, folding the laundry, unloading the dishwasher. Part of that, we're all in this together. So how can we each contribute from the youngest in the family to the most senior that's in the household? Yeah, I, my, uh, my son Max turns 12 on Saturday and his birthday party was canceled a while back. And um, when my, my postdoc, uh, Joseph Windsor, who also helped with uh, some of the slides that I showed earlier, um, he's going to set up a virtual D&D &D game for him and his, um, his friends for his birthday party. Um, yeah. And it's one way for us to kind of connect for a birthday party during the pandemic. Um, yeah. 
those kind of creative ideas are great and one step you might be able to go further if possible is if is if every household could you know each uh, uh, bake a little cake then they could all eat it together that's a good idea. That's a very good idea. So Leslie, thank you so much. And we are going to bring Leslie back um, later in the in the webinar. Um, but what we're going to do now is just pivot to um, a slightly different um, discussion. So I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, there are many patients who have inflammatory bowel disease um, who are currently um, getting uh, infusions um, for their medications. And one of the most uh, common questions um, that was asked um, uh, by patients, particularly those on, on infusion centers, is is what's happening with with infusion centers, and um, will they be able to have maintain the integrity and safety through the course of this pandemic? Um, many many questions ab about that, and um, when we um, developed the Crohn's and Colitis Canada uh, COVID and IBD task force, um, we met on uh, last Tuesday evening was our, our first meeting as a task force. Um, we had representations. For, representatives from all over the country. Um, we went through a whole bunch of things, it was a two-hour video conference, and overwhelmingly the number one concern that was raised was around infusion centers. And so we struck a working group um, within our task force to reach out to um, the heads and the executives of all the different infusion um, uh, companies um, and to talk to them about what they're doing, are their strategies aligned, what are their preparedness, what are the challenges that they're having, how can we help them um, and um, and so we had a, a, an amazing video conference earlier today to go through all these issues. Um, and out of nowhere, this was just designed um, this morning, um, many of those individuals who are on the video conferences um, or representatives from their company um, have agreed to come to, tonight to this webinar um, to answer the questions that you've been asking about infusion clinics. Um, and so I just want to now um, introduce um, these panelists and again, thanking them so much. Everyone has been so busy uh, and I we really appreciate um, them being able to come here and, and talk to us tonight. And so um, if we can um, have the different panelists um, join um, as that's happening, I'm just going to introduce them and, and, um, and their, their um, titles and affiliation. Um, so we have uh, Zoe Vernham, who's the National Director of Nursing Services for Bayshore. Uh, we have Noreen Primo Menzies, who's the Vice President of Inviva and Strategy Projects from McKesson, Canada. Uh, we have Amar um, Pabla, um, who is the uh, Vice President, Nursing Clinics and Scheduling Operations from Inamar. Uh, we have Jeff Hopkins, who's the Director of Inamar Clinics and Scheduling Operations. Uh, we have Julie Casey, Clinical Educator, Cloverdale Infusion Clinics uh, at Bioscripts. Um, and David Ford, who's a pharmacist and also the president and co-founder of Cloverdale Infusion Clinics at Bioscript Solutions. Um, we have so many panelists that we actually have a limit of six people that can be seen, and so I got booted off this uh, thing. So you'll hear me, but you won't you won't see me. Um, but I just I just want to ask a, a few questions, and uh, I'm going to direct them to uh, individuals. Um, but um, I'll um, anyone can jump in and, and respond afterwards. And so the first question I have for is for Amar. Um, and just Amar, if you don't mind just explaining to the audience the different infusion clinics and how they operate in Canada. And the reason why we want to ask this question is that I don't think a lot of patients really understand that the infusion clinics are actually separate entities and they don't necessarily coordinate before a pandemic. And just if you could just describe to the audience what, what they are. So uh, Amar, and you might have to unmute your mic. Perfect. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, thank you, Gil. Uh, so in terms of uh, infusion clinics, uh, you know, there are uh, several infusion clinic providers across the country. Um, but it, it was about two or three weeks ago uh, that the infusion leaders uh, from the four organizations, uh, from uh, Bayshore, uh, from Coverdale, you know, Mar Strategies, and uh, uh, McKesson in Viva, came together uh, in order to uh, create uh, a national uh, working group. So the idea behind was that, uh, you know, we so that we can provide uh, the required uh, care or the continuity of care for these uh, uh, patients. And at the same time, be able to respond uh, to uh, any of the uh, uh, situation as it may uh, evolve. Uh, it, 
uh, and also from the uh, infusion uh, uh, perspective, uh, while we are separate companies uh, and we run different uh, programs, uh, you know, the in in the time of crisis, uh, it's very important uh, that all of us come together uh, in order to uh, share and pool our resources and to be able to respond uh, to the uh, to the patients and also to the healthcare. So, David, just to follow up on a, on a Mars comment, I mean, you're the president and co-founder of Cloverdale Infusion Clinics, um, and you're operating a, a company, and I just want you to talk about what it's like to actually integrate multiple different companies that are all doing the same things, but before pandemic, they're competitors, and, and, and now you guys are working together hand in hand, just to kind of let us know that process and, and, and how that came to be. Sure, uh, thanks. Uh, we've actually always know, known each other. Uh, this has been actually a great opportunity to actually, to actually work together uh, and also to validate uh, the processes that we've been doing ourselves. Uh, and no time like now with the pandemic facing us. So as was mentioned, we formed a task force last month uh, and we're meeting regularly. Uh, so we're comparing our, our processes and procedures and our best practices uh, against each other's and all trying to get ideas uh, of how to treat what's going on today and also preparing us what may come over the next few weeks or months. Uh, we know that this is not a short-term issue, um, but actually this, the cooperation has been great. Uh, it's been on all levels. Uh, and the, the goal is to safeguard our patients, uh, our staff, uh, and our supplies, make sure that we have enough equipment to last through this pandemic. And also our goal is to keep all the clinics open across the country. Uh, and if we can't, uh, how can we come up with solutions together? Uh, we've even contacted all the provincial health authorities amongst us uh, to make sure that we are designated essential services uh, so that these clinics will stay open and our staff can work. Um, thanks, David. And I just want to know that one of the, the tasks that the COVID IBD task force is working with um, uh, the, all the infusion clinics is to work with the governments to label um, the infusion networks as essential services. We're, we're supportive of you in, in that effort. We think it's so important. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, how, how are the infusion clinics across Canada integrated during the pandemic? What are, can you give us some examples of things that, that you're doing um, kind of technically and logistically um, to help kind of bring these infusion clinics together and, and particularly if you foresee any challenges in the future. Absolutely. Um, I'm first of all so impressed with all of my colleagues. We have been working together um, to make sure that all patients are able to be seen. So we've all shared our list of uh, infusion clinic addresses with each other. We've all designated uh, one person um, you know, on each team to make sure that if there's a need, uh, we make sure those patients are seen. Um, Jeff and I were working together over the last couple of days. Noreen, we're all working together to make sure patients are taken care of. Um, in some cases where we might experience a shortage of nursing staff, either due to illness or isolation or other reasons, we've been able to make sure that patients' appointments um, are still taking place, whether they go to the um, clinic they're originally going to or go to a neighboring clinic. So it's, it's really great to see everybody working together. Excellent. Um, and, and if anyone has an additional comment about, about integration and, and how you guys are working together, um, you, you can definitely um, uh, let, us, let us know. Um, so I'll just, I'll just echo what Zoe was saying there. Um, on a, we, we have a weekly call set up, a uh, weekly collaboration call, but uh, Zoe and I and, and Noreen can attest, we've talked more often than that, uh, especially uh, in the last uh, few, few days as, as community spread has started to take, take hold and we've had to uh, cross cover each other's patients uh, this week, in fact, in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, today, Bayshore saw several patients of Inamars uh, where we had a, a nurse sick call on a last minute basis. So thank you, Zoe, for you and your team and your help uh, today uh, because you saved those uh, pa patient appointments in, in Newfoundland this morning. Well, thank you, Jeff. And in, up in Timmins, uh, Ontario, you did the same thing for Bayshore. So it's really great. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I just wanted to stress to everyone who is on the webinar is I, I hope you can, you can hear that, that there, people are coming together. If there's a problem in infusion clinic X, 
Um, there is a whole network within that entire fusion clinic company, but now what we're seeing is reaching out and helping across the companies. And, and I think that integrated support, I mean, it just, it just shows the compassion and caring and, uh, of, of everyone who is involved in this um, together. Um, I wanted to, to pivot a bit more to more kind of technical questions or, or around specific things that, that patients with IBD um, should be considering and thinking about. And, and, and Julie, I have a question for you is uh, around patient support programs and just how, how are the patient support programs evolving now to help patients with IBD during this pandemic? Well, I, the patient support programs are still operating um, just due to volumes of, of calls and emails and that sort of thing. There may be some delays, but they're, you know, responding to questions and to concerns. They're, they've always been a great central source of, of information and uh, education. And if they don't have the answers, they will help you find them. Um, whether or not that's something within their field or reaching out to some of our other partners and all these different companies that are working together um, and making sure that we all have the most up-to-date information. Um, and the patient support programs are also you know, helping with things like um, screening of the patients as well as rescheduling, like depending on, on the you know, situation for uh, that particular patient or their exposure or risk and that sort of thing is helping to coordinate another appointment for them as soon as possible within um, the guidelines for their particular situation. Excellent. And maybe, maybe I would just add one comment to that about something else that they're doing that I think is meaningful is um, patients that are on injections that could maybe move to self-injections and not actually come into the clinics. The patient support programs have been very valuable in starting those conversations so that we as in the clinics and the nurses could train patients to self-inject, which might be a great strategy going forward in the next couple of months. That's a, that's a great comment, Noreen, and I would I would even expand on that to say that um, I think most of us are all working on virtual strategies, and so virtual injection training is another way we're looking to support patients. We're kind of seeing a shift to those who can do a virtual injection training, do it that way, and it um, allows us more capacity in clinic. Um, so I think that you know we're we're looking at doing things differently, and it's um, kind of pushed us into innovating. But I think it's great. Yeah, and I would just add that for those patients who um, are on a biologic um, and you've interacted with your patient support program for, for years um, and they've helped in so many different facets, this is just another way that they can help you is that if you have questions or concerns, um, you can reach out to them because they have all of the standards, policies, they know exactly what's happened. And if there's a question they don't, uh, can't answer for you right away, they're gonna find those answers for you. And they can be a, your kind of primary gatekeeper, um, particularly if um, there are, are challenges that may arise during the pandemic. And, and that kind of brings us to um, our next uh, question. And Noreen, I was just gonna ask you um, if how are infusion clinics screening patients and their staff for COVID symptoms, you could just kind of walk through everyone what, what's happening to keep to keep everyone safe. Yeah, this has been one of the key strategies we started all of us about two or three weeks ago as, as public health started coming out with recommendations because the number one thing we can do to keep our patients safe in the clinics is not to have people who are at risk in the clinics. And so we all built screening tools and those screening tools have evolved as the guidelines have evolved. Um, in the beginning, they didn't include the same restrictions around travel, but when the 14 day rule came in, we all changed our screening tools. And so we've been evolving those screening tools and how we've been implementing them in the clinics is trying to reach the patients ahead of time. So calling patients, um, informing patients and screening them so that patients are actually screened before they come into the clinic so that if they are positive, then we interact then and move their appointments and have conversations with them about what that looks like. Some of us have, have, have actually been able to put in automated screening tools at this point on appointment reminders and people can self-screen as they're, as they're um, uh, confirming their appointments. So we've been able to move this forward fairly quickly and it's a very, uh, very useful and effective strategy for us. The other thing we're telling patients is that if you screen negative and it's two days before your appointment, but your symptoms change before you come into the clinic to call us if you have a fever, take your temperature, that kind of thing, to ensure that the patients coming into the clinics are, are, are actually as healthy as we can and have them and that we're not bringing high-risk people into the clinics. 
And remember, if, if any patient is running into a concern um, and there's anything that happens that potentially would delay your infusion, I mean, that, that's the time where you want to reach out to your healthcare provider, your gastroenterologist, so, so, help, so that they can help you navigate um, what to do, ranging from whether it needs to um, delay an infusion for a little bit and when it's safe to come, come back to it. And that's the key role of the partnership with your healthcare provider. Um, and again, along the, the same lines, um, so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how uh, infusion clinics are cleaning and preventing, um, or creating precautions to keep um, patients with IBD safe as well as their staff. Yeah, very good question. So it, it starts with what Noreen mentioned about screening, but then um, when you think about the clinics, clinics have always had IPAC standard or infection prevention and control standards in place. As healthcare professionals, we've always done that. Over the last um, several months, we've had task force working on what to do in the case of this pandemic, and so we've increased cleaning practices. Um, there's certainly increased surface cleaning. We use Virox wipes, which are uh, wipes that we use on the surfaces and on the chairs and between patients. There's absolutely increased hand washing. Um, several weeks ago, we started asking every patient to wash their hands when they arrived at the clinic, which was something that hadn't been done before. There's obviously sanitizer at the clinics. We're lucky to still have it available, but actually asking patients to wash their hands with warm soapy water for more than 20 seconds and showing patients how to do this properly. And I think there's some amazing videos out there on hand washing, and I would recommend everybody watch um, those videos because even, you know, lots of people think they wash their hands well, may not. So washing for at least 20 seconds is really, really important. Um, we're also trying to do social distancing inside the clinics, meaning we're trying to move patients away from each other, trying to spread out the infusions over the day so less people are there at the same time. Um, physically spacing them apart, putting a physical barrier in between them. We have some vinyl screens that we can put between chairs and we wipe those down again with the Virox wipes. Um, I think everybody is really, really hypersensitive to the need to clean everything, clean their hands. Um, patients are, are in um, some cases being provided with a mask as well to wear inside the clinic in case they can't be uh, far apart enough from the next patient um, and the nurses are wearing uh, what we call PPE or personal protective equipment to make sure that they're also protected uh, in this case and at all times and washing hands lots and lots. And I just want if, to add, if any of the other panelists wants to add anything else in terms of uh, cleanings, precautions, preventions, um, I, I would just make one comment, and I think everybody's aware of this, is there's a global shortage of personal protective equipment. And so as infusion clinics, we've all been looking at our policies and how we're implementing that PPE and when we're implementing that PPE um, from a risk perspective. And as the risk in certain areas of community outbreak increases, it's been increasing. So we're all moving to all of the clinics eventually will get there. I would say probably right now, not every clinic everywhere needs it from a risk perspective. But, you know, if we had this conversation next week probably would be um, but we're trying to make the make that life last longer for our personal protective equipment as there is a global shortage and we're all working hard to make sure we have enough of it when we need it it's a good point Noreen and I think you know we always have to look for good things when we're in this kind of difficult situation and we've seen all kinds of companies stepping up so uh, Labatt stepping up and making hand, hand uh, sanitizer um, there's a company called Bauer who makes hockey equipment in Canada that are making face shields and those should be ready soon. So we, while we do have a shortage and we're working really uh, diligently to get through that, we're also seeing some great things with uh, companies that would normally manufacture one thing and they've been changing their production line to help, uh, help healthcare companies out. And, and Jeff, the last question I have for you, um, Zoe was talking about uh, social distancing within the clinic and I realized that the footprint of, of many of the infusion clinics um, can be small and so if all of a sudden you're trying to get six feet means there's less space, means there's less chairs and I just want you to talk a little bit about um, what's happening with infusion capacity and how that could affect people with IBD. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question and um, the clinics across Canada, across all four of our companies come in all shapes, sizes and uh, big, you know, large, small, 10 chairs, 12 chairs, two chairs, one chair. And obviously one chair is perfectly ideal because that's the ultimate uh, social uh, distancing because it's only one patient and the nurse. But that's not the reality in, you know, in most of our infusion clinics, we need to have more than one chair. So, so in the larger clinics, it's somewhat simpler because we can just rearrange the layout of the clinic and the chairs in the clinic to, to provide the 
the two arms length or two meter spacing. Sometimes maybe we have to remove a chair or, or not book patients into a chair so that we can ensure that social distancing by rearranging. Um, but yes, in the smaller uh, clinics, that can sometimes be challenging or you're removing a chair to ensure social distancing and then you're reducing your overall capacity or available space for patients to get infused. So um, what, what we all are doing is ensuring that we have social distancing in the clinics, regardless of what size it is, and then flexing the hours of operation, offering more hours on the weekends, offering more hours on the, on the evenings or early mornings uh, or whatever, right? So that we're able to still see the same number of patients and more patients, even though maybe we're, we've had to cut back on a chair to ensure that we have the right amount of spacing. Zoe mentioned about uh, vinyl screens that can be cleaned. Uh, in, that's also another uh, option in smaller clinics where it's harder to get that spacing. Um, we can install these uh, temporary or, or movable screens and then wipe them down in between patients as well. And while the spacing might not be full two meters, there's a physical barrier between the two, essentially taking a room and dividing it into two with a, uh, with a, with a movable screen. So these are some of the things that we're doing to uh, encourage social distancing in the clinics while also ensuring that there's adequate access across the, the uh, network for uh, appointments to happen. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I just wanted to add as well in terms of visitors, um, we've made sure that we kind of changed our policy used to welcome visitors and now we have a no visitor policy except for what we would call an essential visitor. So certainly uh, the parent of a minor child or somebody who's needed for mobility assistance could be um, allowed to come into the clinic. But besides that, there really are no visitors allowed. And um, most of our patients and families have been really understanding, um, you know, understanding the need for social distancing and less people coming in. Uh, and that's another measure that we're we're looking at. And yeah, I just that's, a great, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment that, you know, I we have experienced that patients have been amazing through this for us. And we've had to move patients a lot in the last couple of weeks as we adjusted to this and moved our capacity around and sorted out how we were going to al uh, align to social distancing or physical distancing. So, you know, I, I know patients have gone through a lot, but they've been very flexible and, it, and very accommodating, which has made it easier for all of us. Yeah, I'd echo that to uh, Noreen. The patients have been very flexible. Uh, when things needed to shift or move around. Very understanding, very flexible in this uh, very difficult time. Our goal is to service everybody and, and make sure everybody gets seen. And and uh, we do appreciate your understanding when things are shifting. Things are moving very fast and uh, we're moving as fast as we can to keep up with the changes. Right, and just to add to, uh, to what Jeff just said, I guess the key point here is for us to not to interrupt uh, the continuity of care. Um, you know, Gail and Eric both commented on how important it is for, for the patients to stay on their treatment, for patients to continue to come and get their infusions. We want to make sure that the environment that we are creating uh, is safe uh, and uh, at the same time safe for them and safe for our, our nursing staff so that we can provide that quality of care and we can uh, we can provide that uninterrupted care over the long term. Yeah, and I just want to end by thanking all of the panelists and just to remind everyone uh, in the audience that uh, you know we met this morning um, and then I and then we had an amazing video conference to ensure the safety and the integrity of the infusion clinics and we're all going to be working very closely together over the weeks. Um, uh, between Crohn's and Colitis Canada, between healthcare providers, between the infusion clinics, and, and reaching out to provincial um, health authorities as well to ensure the integrity and the safety of infusion clinics throughout this pandemic. Um, and again, I just want to thank everyone. You weren't expecting to be here tonight talking about infusion clinics, um, but I, I'm sure everybody who's watching this is appreciative of, of everything you said. Thank you so much. Thank you, and that's what we're here for. What we do, so we're glad to help. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Gil, and thanks to all uh, the the participants from the infusion clinics. That was really useful.
Uh, I know we're all worried about how that's going to go, but it sounds like people have things in hand, well in hand. Uh, so for the next segment, we're going to talk to two uh, physicians. Uh, Dr. Anne Femhui is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at my institution, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. Uh, that's not Anne, that's Cynthia, but Anne will come up soon. Uh, she is an assistant professor of pediatrics. There's Anne. Uh, she's an assistant professor of pediatrics at University of Ottawa and chair of Immunize Canada. She's the physician lead at CHEO for the primary immunodeficiency clinic as well. Uh, her research interests include immunizations, infections in, in the immunocompromised, but important in this aspect is uh, her interest in management of infants born to mothers who are on biologics during pregnancy. So thank you for joining Anne. And our second participant is uh, Dr. Cynthia Xiao who is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the uh, University of Calgary in the Department of Medicine, as well as the Communi Department of Community Health Sciences. And she's an adult gastroenterologist and clinician investigator at University of Calgary with an interest in IBD and a specific interest in uh, special populations from pediatric to adult and IBD in pregnancy as well. So thank you for joining Cynthia. Um, so I'd like to start just a little bit of an introduction from both of you. Cynthia, can you tell me a little bit about what your role is as an IBD pregnancy expert and how you're coping these days with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you, Eric and Gil and uh, Crohn's and Colitis Canada uh, for this opportunity. Yeah, there's obviously a lot of concern with our um, pregnant women, specifically with IBD around the COVID crisis. We've done our very best to try and reassure women that at this time they should be taking all the precautions that everybody else is taking and the primary precaution is to ensure that they're physically distancing as everybody else is, to make sure that they're washing their hands and as you heard earlier the biggest message I think from our special cohort is that if they are on medications to stay on those medications because the most important thing in, whether they're pregnant or not pregnant, or whether it's COVID or not COVID, is to keep them healthy. And in keeping with that, we've always told our pregnant patients that they should be much more concerned about the risks of active disease rather than any risks of using medications, because it's active disease that will, especially in light of COVID, that will make them more likely to need to go in for investigations that might include laboratory investigations, which means that they have to visit a clinic and that makes it more difficult to physically distance yourself, even though every, um, you know, every opportunity is being done at the moment to try and improve things. If patients are sick, they're more likely to need an in-clinic rather than a telephone consultation. They're more likely to require coming into hospital. And so all of those things increase the risk of COVID exposure just by the proximity to other people that are sick. So I think my three big, biggest messages for the IBD pregnant um, cohort is number one, do the physical distancing that everyone else is doing. Keep yourself and baby safe. Number two, wash your hands really well, as um, I'm sure Anne and everybody else will continue to tell us about. And number three, be much more concerned about the risks of active disease then active medications, keep on your medications, keep healthy, and that will give you the best chance for you and baby to stay well. Thanks very much, Cynthia. I appreciate it. And um, Anne, can you tell us a little bit about your role as a pediatric infectious disease expert and how things are going these days in the hospital? Uh, I won't lie, it's been a bit of a roller coaster and quite surreal for everyone. Uh, I don't think anyone not impacted by some way by this pandemic um, but obviously for us uh, we've been watching this very closely since the first signals that uh, came out in early January uh, we even presented all the initial data in early January so we could see it coming um, I must even admit that it's it's hard to believe that we're where you know a couple of countries were a few weeks or, or months ago so it's been very busy uh, mostly for by preparing, so thinking of all the potential scenarios. Um, so I would say right now it's it's really preparedness because uh, you know the numbers are increasing as you see on a daily basis, and so we're starting to see the numbers go up. Um, and uh, concerned that we uh, like in the presentation that we don't surpass that um, that that limit uh, of our healthcare system and. Um, and flatten that curve. So I would echo everything that uh, Cynthia has said. Um, it's really a lot of common sense. Uh, there's a lot of 
studies right now, a lot of clinical trials and an immense number of clinical trials looking at different uh, antiviral and different uh, treatments. But to be honest, I think the most effective ones are the are, are fairly simple that everyone uh, can participate and actually do, which is what we've throughout this whole presentation. So the physical distancing, um, you know, hand washing, uh, understanding your symptoms, self-isolate, isolate, et cetera. That's great. Thanks. And uh, Cynthia, going back to you, what happens uh, to the medications, which you recommended continuing, but what if the, the pregnant woman tests positive for COVID-19? Uh, that's a very tricky question. We um, feel that it is important for patients, as we said, to continue on their medications. We know that active disease in itself increases the risk of adverse outcomes for the mum and for the baby. And the most likely one of that is the risk of preterm birth, babies being born before um, 37 weeks of age. And those babies just aren't so strong. They're more likely to be at risk of infections themselves. So it is tricky when we talk about um, a, a woman who is pregnant and does, um, you know, she should not stop her medications during the pregnancy um, at all. If she does unfortunately become COVID positive, that's difficult because most of the medications that we use for IBD have long half-lives. So I would advise if the patient was actually due to infuse during those 14 days or so, that that may be delayed. But most of the medications otherwise are usually quite well spaced out when you're talking about medications such as the infusions, the oral medications such as azathioprine and all that stick around in the system for quite some time. So that's why we really do, do advise for patients if they're not COVID positive to continue on their medications. If they are COVID positive, please contact your physician, but don't do things alone. Let us know we're here to help. Thanks, and we are, absolutely. I think there's people working around the clock really trying to answer calls, trying to answer questions. So please do call your nurse, your physician, whoever your first, first point of contact is with, with questions that you may have. Um, and another question, uh, can a pregnant patient uh, who's infected with COVID-19 pass the virus to her baby? That's a very good question, and it's been on everyone's, uh, many people's minds. Um, so there's been uh, uh, an increasing number of probably small case series. So um, in total, maybe 40 to 50 pregnant women that have been reported um, to be infected uh, with COVID-19 during pregnancy, or at least highly suspected to have COVID-19 during their pregnancy. Uh, these women have been followed very closely and at the time of delivery, uh, according to these reports, they were tested. So different samples were tested at birth, including uh, amniotic fluid, uh, mother's blood, um, breast milk, uh, vaginal secretions, um, cord blood, um, and all of those tests uh, have, become, have were negative, uh, which uh, is very reassuring to hear. So again, this is it, it's still not robust data, but at least it's all pointing to the same uh, the same finding. Uh, so at this time, uh, there does not seem to be, or at least the experts' opinion is that there is no transmission of the virus during pregnancy. However, uh, there is evidence that there is shedding in stool. Uh, and obviously, if you have a symptomatic mother, so a mom, a mom that is um, uh, coughing, uh, having congestion, uh, the main mode of transmission is by droplets, so through these secretions. And therefore, if she's uh, symptomatic, she could pass it on to her newborn uh, child. And I guess that would be a concern during breastfeeding as well. I think I read that basically it doesn't get transmitted by breast milk. However, if you're actively symptomatic and you you may be... Uh, contagious, that can be a problem with breastfeeding. What do you recommend uh, mothers do? So another good question. So again, just to, to, to think about how it's transmitted. So if the mom is symptomatic and she's, um, you know, coughing, there is definitely a concern that the, the baby could get infected. And so there are various, um, you know, recommendations at this point, again, based on the, how it's transmitted. So if the mother is feeling well, but she might have a bit of you know, a bit of a sore throat, a bit of a runny nose, um, and to wear a mask, so it acts as a barrier. Um, you know, some centers are saying go ahead and continue to breastfeed because, as you say, uh, at this point, there is no evidence that it's transmitted through the breast milk. Um, 
in the context that the mother is unwell, too unwell to, to breastfeed or wear a mask, um, there are some uh, experts that suggest um, uh, pumping um, express belt breast milk and to have a asymptomatic or unaffected or an un un uninfected uh, caregiver provide the milk to the to the infant. Thanks. Again, you want to avoid transmission of the, of the actual droplet. Absolutely. Um, Cynthia, is there any evidence or, or any thoughts about what the method of delivery? So should a mother be delivering vaginally? Should she be delivering by C-section? What's your approach to that? Yeah, in general, um, for any women with IBD, the only times where we usually recommend consideration for a cesarean section over vaginal delivery is if a mum has active perianal Crohn's disease or if they've had extensive pelvic surgery such as a ileoanal pouch. So the vast majority of the time, we make the, the obstetricians make the decision about mode of delivery based on obstetrical considerations rather than gastroenterologic considerations. So again, to reiterate, unless a woman has active perianal disease or has an ileoanal pouch, the decision to deliver should be made by the obstetrician. And obviously, there's other obstetric considerations. If the baby's too, head is too big and the baby gets stuck and the baby's coming up, you know, feet first, those are obstetric considerations. In light of COVID, um, it is true that the majority of the babies that were delivered in China were delivered by cesarean section, but there may have been other reasons for that. It was not because then um, I think they were initially uncertain whether there could be maternal to fetal transmission by the vaginal delivery. But as Anne has mentioned, all the sampling that's been done so far hasn't really demonstrated that that is a big issue at all. So at this point in time, we would say that the obstetricians do make the decision independent of the COVID and just take into account, number one, the IBD considerations, but more likely just the obstetric consideration. And maybe you can both jump in on this question, but should women feel safe delivering in a hospital during a pandemic? I would, I would say yes. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's no one's birth plan to, to deliver during a pandemic, but I um, mean, the hospitals have been preparing for this. I know at least in our institution, there are daily meetings to ensure the safety of um, the, 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 the parents, the, the, the pregnant women and the healthcare providers as well. Uh, however, obviously there is going to be some changes that are noted when you come to the hospital. Uh, most um, institutions have, have, um, pretty clear uh, restriction of visitors, for example, and screeners to ensure that no one uh, comes into the hospital with any kind of symptom uh, suggestive of a respiratory illness or, or fever. Um, I think it's not a bad time, uh, as much as the hospital is being prepared also for the, um, the, the pregnant uh, person to be, to be prepared as well in terms of uh, she sh should have maybe some backup caregivers in case the, you know, the, the, the designated partner would be or, or, or caregiver would be uh, symptomatic at the time of the delivery. So just to have uh, extra help as backup. Uh, but again, uh, the most institutions will not allow um, uh, multiple visitors uh, at the time of delivery. So there will be some change. Mm -hmm. And I think the caveat from a clinic perspective is that our IBD patients know that we're trying to convert most of our in-clinic visits to telephone clinics from an IBD standpoint. But from an obstetric standpoint, that's, that may be a little bit trickier. We have encouraged all our patients to speak to the obstetrician's office to see whether there are some appointments that can be converted to telehealth um, visits or just telephone clinics. But obviously, if there is a need for obstetrical ultrasound and the patient's uh, advised to come in, then they should do so because ultimately, it is the health of the baby that's most important. And then, as Anne mentioned, whether it's in a hospital setting, a clinic setting, an infusion clinic setting, patients are being screened appropriately. Everyone is taking extra precautions. So please don't try and avoid coming in for scheduled visits if you have been asked to specifically turn up for that visit. Yeah, that's okay. a really important message. Yeah, it's a really important message. Um, so I'd read, uh, Anne, that uh, while we talk about pediatric patients, children doing very well when they get COVID, meaning they don't need hospitalization as often and they, they rarely die, what about newborns? What if a newborn gets COVID? 
That's a good question. Um, maybe I'll flip a bit to the pediatric data so far. Um, again, there's been, uh, you know, every day almost, it seems that there's new reports uh, of uh, uh, the clinical symptoms or, or how how does this infection act in children? Uh, and again, the grand majority of the data that's come is reassuring in the sense that kids actually don't seem to uh, be too sick with COVID-19 uh, compared to other older groups, as you've mentioned in your presentation. However, there's very little data on the on actual newborn. So for, for us in pediatrics, we consider a newborn uh, within the first 28 days of life. So there's, there's very few reports of the a case series, so the, the, the studies that have looked at these pregnant women that were positive uh, during pregnancy, uh, their newborns were not sick and, and there was, um, you know, if any, infected. And so none of these children uh, developed significant symptoms. So it's hard to say at this point, I don't think we have the answer. It, there, there hasn't been any, sig any real reports of, of newborns having severe disease at this time. Right. And I actually read, I, I know the CDC just released their numbers, I think yesterday, uh, and it was up until March 20, March 16th, rather. Uh, and the numbers in the United States, there was, I think, in the range of 123 uh, children under the age of 18 who had developed COVID and none of them died and none of them needed an ICU or a ventilator, which is excellent news. We don't know how many of them were infants or newborns, but uh, very exactly. good news from the United States so far. Obviously, as the numbers increase, that could change a little bit, but uh, we're still very hopeful that children who develop COVID do very, very well. Um, Cynthia, what can a pregnant woman with IBD do to protect herself against acquiring COVID? I think it goes back to the three things that we talked about at the beginning, and that is making sure that you're physically distancing yourself um, as we've made, a, a, as Gil and Eric said at the beginning, um, this means physically distancing, but not socially distancing yourself from other people. Keep in touch with people. We know that mental health, particularly in pregnancy, is really, really important. So keep in contact with family and friends. Um, so that's the physical distancing point of view. The second one is keeping your hands really, really clean, washing your hands. And after, even when baby is born, of course, if you're breastfeeding and things, it goes without saying that you should turn your head if you're going to sneeze. You don't sneeze on baby's head while you're feeding them. Simple things like that. But, you know, people have been asking whether they should be avoiding breastfeeding at all, and they shouldn't be, as we've already discussed. And the third thing is keep yourself as healthy as you can. Active IBD leads to bad mum and baby outcomes and having COVID in addition to bad IBD, you can only imagine what the potential for bad outcomes would be. So keep yourselves as healthy as possible. And even though it's difficult times, you know, enjoy the pregnancy and enjoy the time that you can spend with those who are closest to you at home. And do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I would follow, like I said, all the, the, the general guidance, um, uh, public health uh, officials are, are have been saying over and, and over again, and and sounds repetitive, but it, it really it is the key to to uh, to avoiding uh, infection. Um, so definitely agree to 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 keep physical health, but also mental health throughout throughout this journey. And any special considerations about social distancing from the partner or social distancing from uh, pets in the home, for example. Yeah, so again, it's just, a, it's a, I've been asked this question from, uh, from many people, um, you know, how do you do so you don't bring it to your home or, or spread it within the household as well? Because we know that in uh, at least uh, definitely the early studies that had come out, it was really household contact. So you do need to have some close contact and bring, it goes back to how this infection is transmitted. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we talk about, you um, you know, maybe disinfecting certain high-touch uh, surfaces within your home. Um, again, the hand washing, the cough etiquette. Um, in terms of uh, partners, it's I think it's a, a difficult, um, it's a personal thing as well. But uh, uh, again, I think if um, if one can be very aware of symptoms and ensure that even you know at the if you're feeling a little bit achy or a bit of a scratchy throat, that might be the first symptom. So in, in, in that case, to try to, to, to um, uh, yeah, like avoid uh, 
I mean, self-isolating within your home <laughs> to a certain degree from your partner or from your family. Uh, I, I won't go into details because I, I went through this scenario with many different colleagues and friends and everybody has their own ways of <laughs> self-isolating within their own home. So, but again, these are just general principles of, of transmission of the infection. One question that I want to ask Easier is, yeah, absolutely. Um, one question that I want to ask, uh, a last question for the two of you is, uh, we know that some biologics are transmitted to the baby through the placenta and uh, that babies do have serum levels, for example, of certain biologics when they're born. Are there any considerations of issues there? Do we know anything about COVID when, when the mom is on a biologic in the baby? Well, we don't have that data yet. Um, as you might be aware, there's a national study looking at um, immune responses in babies who are exposed um, in utero to biologics. Um, we don't have the results of that study yet, but it's the same thing. Those babies should still be kept at home. You know, you, it, even though it's difficult and everybody wants to see the, the cute baby, um, they need to keep their distance and um, there'll be plenty of time in the baby's life to get to meet lots of people afterwards, but just keep those babies as healthy and safe and unfortunately isolated during this time. Yeah, so Great. I'd like to just add on that so uh, i hope um if there are any pregnant women on on the on the webinar um there is a, a national uh collaborative um effort uh throughout canada so um where we have uh, clinics to be able to uh, evaluate and and um and provide guidance on what to do to the infants that are exposed to biologics um from their mothers during pregnancy uh, and as you know as eric mentioned uh, many of these babies are born with drug levels that are actually higher than the mums so there is a obviously a, a thought that there is an impact on the on the immune system of of the baby um some reassuring data, I mean, this is still very early and there's a lot more questions and answers at this point, which is why it's important to, to better understand what happens to these babies. But uh, when we do see them in their clinics, we, we do do a few tests to see uh, if there's any, Im any big impact on their immune system. Uh, I would say in general, it looks, the numbers look normal, the function look normal, but we give the same guidance, which I would give at this point to any newborn, uh, born during this pandemic, it, it's it's like Cynthia said, it's not the time to have a big party, um, hand washing, um, you know, stay home, uh, avoid any infection at this point, because we don't know what the effect of the biologics on the infant plus COVID plus, you know, just being a newborn. Uh, so more data to come I probably in the next uh, few weeks and months, but at this point it's still early and I haven't seen any report of any infant born to a mom with COVID on biologics and being infected. So <laughs> hopefully Agreed. you won't see we're too very, many of those. Yeah, we're very early and uh, we'll see what develops, but I think your messages have been very clear. I appreciate the time that you've spent and thanks so much for joining us. I do have one last question related to pregnant women with IBD for, for Dr. Graf. Um, and so Dr. Graf, how can pregnant women and newborns cope in the time of the pandemic? So both Dr. Pham Hui and Dr. Xiao sort of mentioned don't have visitors, don't have the grandparents over, don't have people coming into the home to see the baby. That's really hard, obviously, for a new mom uh, and, a new, and a new father as well, right? You want to share the, the joy of having a new baby. Uh, so it can be very stressful and very uh, sort of anxiety provoking as well. How, how do you recommend pregnant women and, and uh, new moms cope with this? Yes, there's been some very good advice by our colleagues just a few moments ago around the ways to stay safe and to stay healthy and to stay protected. But so much of that involves being away from all the natural supports you would have in pregnancy and when you have a new baby. So um, it's an exciting time and it's an anxiety provoking time without a pandemic and you put a pandemic on top of that and the anxiety and the fear can really ramp up. Um, I think one of the ways to think about it is those would be normal reactions in what's very much an abnormal situation. So thinking about the comment I'd made earlier around psychological closeness, this, is, this really is a time to um, connect in any ways that you can 
virtually is mostly what it's going to be. But you know, the grandparents and and uh, aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews are going to want to see that new baby. So help them to see that new baby. They just can't come over to visit. Send pictures. Link up by Skype. Have little mini five minute visits every day to be able to um, see what the baby's doing now and how you're doing. Another way, another aspect to think about is what would you do without a pandemic, without being in the middle of a pandemic, is often connecting with other um, uh, families with, you know, a, a new baby or connecting with other pregnant moms and just being able to compare notes, uh, share a little bit about fears and worries and how that's going. So the staying connected virtually is one key piece. Another key piece is aiming to stay in the now because our fears and worries are going to really, really build up through this time. Um, where there's some good reassuring information that so far, what we know is that um, you know, we, children do okay, we think so far right now, babies may do okay, um, but uh, being able to, but of course our minds get going with what if, what if I get sick, what if my partner gets sick, what if the baby gets sick, that's all looking in the future. So aiming to stay in right now, Right now, I'm home with few distractions because we can't go anywhere. And so really aiming to enjoy that time uh, that you're home and keep bringing those worries and fears back to, but we're okay right now. We're doing all of the steps that we know how to do to protect, uh, to look after you know, your health um, and, um, and, and be able to uh, just focus on enjoying the baby and uh, in, in, you know, building from those steps. Sometimes you have to get very specific about talking back to those worries. Um, and so that's where the staying informed is quite helpful because um, you may you know, hear things on social media about uh, this or that. Coming into a webinar like this where people are, are uh, professionals are staying connected with the up to the minute information about how this is all going to unfold and how this might affect you and your baby helps to talk back to those worries um, that uh, that can really then have you not sleeping well and not eating well, which then again starts to undermine your health. So stay connected virtually, stay in the now, focus on now, not two weeks from now or six months from now, um, and stay informed. Great, thanks so much. And I really want to thank all of the panelists, all of the people who have who have been uh, on the call so far. Um, I want to end by particularly thanking Crohn's and Colitis Canada, whose staff and volunteers have put in a lot of work for these webinars and to help us organize and provide the uh, educational documents and the guidance documents that are on the website. Uh, we're all living in really uncertain times. We're all scared. We're scared about our health. We're scared about our jobs, our finances, about the economy. Uh, and, uh, you know, the volunteers and staff at Crohn's and Colitis Canada are really putting in a lot of effort to try to uh, make this uh, the best experience that we can and try to help you through it and support you through it, knowing that you have that extra stress of living with Crohn's and colitis. Um, unfortunately, it's a really troubling time uh, for everybody, but especially for Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Uh, considering that they've had to cancel all of their in-person fundraising events and donor appreciation events, that means the cash flow has really, really slowed down and we're really in a crunch time at this point. Uh, I think you can see how much we care, um, and I say we because I'm part of Crohn's and Colitis Canada, but it's really the staff and the volunteers that do all the work, uh, how much they care about you and how much effort they're putting in to teach you, to bring together experts on a volunteer basis like this, uh, to advocate for you uh, on behalf of you uh, to you know, the, the biologic companies, the infusion centers, the government and other places to make sure that you're still on their radar and still paying attention to your needs, despite all of this chaos going around on around you. So I would really ask if you appreciate what's happening, if you appreciate all the effort that is being put in by Crohn's and Colitis Canada and considering all the in-person fundraising has had to stop, please, please, please donate to Crohn's and Colitis Canada at their website, crohnsandcolitis.ca. Every little penny that you can afford helps. It really will help us get through these, these troubled times and these rough waters that we're facing. And I'm hoping that you have uh, enough left over in these times to be able to donate a little bit to Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Uh, Gil, do you have anything to add there? 
No, you were so eloquent. I echo every one of your comments. Um, and the only thing I just wanted to add above and beyond that is just, again, to thank the healthcare workers, the healthcare um, heroes. Um, many of us are facing a difficult time. We've had very difficult conversations with loved ones. Um, we're all scared uh, and we don't know what it's going to happen, but we are going to be there to help people through this time. Um, and similarly, we're going to be here every week, Thursday evening, through this pandemic, answering your questions and helping you through it as well. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. We're here for you. We're here to answer your questions. Please keep sending your questions in. We hope to have another one going, another webinar going next week. Uh, we'll announce what the topics will be a little bit later, uh, probably early next week. But please sign up for the next webinar if you're interested in learning more. Uh, and please send in your questions as well as please fill out the evaluation so that we know how we can improve. Mina, you're muted, I think. There we go. Thank you. Um, thank you, Eric and Gil. Uh, as our moderators, we're so grateful to you and the expert panels. As you heard earlier today, that our expert panels just came together today, and we were able to put all this content together for you. As uh, Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Benjamin said earlier, these are very trying times for us. Crohn's and Colitis Canada has had to cancel a lot of events and our fundraising has go gone down considerably, but we continue to support you and we're so grateful to our COVID task force, our Scientific Medical Advisory Council, especially Dr. Gil Kaplan, Dr. Eric Benjamal for all that they've done working around the clock to bring this information to you that you have asked us to provide to you. Um, I'm so proud to see how everyone's come together, how everyone's connected together. We thank you for coming together as our community. We can thank you as being our volunteers and working with us, our donors, our, our, um, our expert panels, our scientific medical advisory councils, the researchers. And I also want to thank our staff who are working around the clock to make sure that we're able to be there for you, to support you and bring the information that's important to you at these very difficult times. So we're going to try very hard to keep you informed. Please uh, take a look at our website. Uh, follow us at Crohn's and Colitis Canada at Get Gutsy Canada. Um, you will, you'll see a lot of different uh, content on there and by email you'll receive some e-blasts. You're at the heart of what we do and why we do what we're doing. So as I said to you over and over again, we're here to support you and we hope that you continue to uh, work with us and collaborate with us. Please stay safe during this time. Thank you and be well.